good morning, everybody. I'm looking forward to being with all my allies from the Colorectal Cancer Alliance group today. And I have had the pleasure of speaking with you. Maybe some of you saw me about 10 years ago and when we could actually get together. Those are the old days. Now, these days, I know where all the toilet paper is, the mask, the antibacterial soap. And, you know, they say that some people gain like 19 pounds during COVID-19. I have always been an overachiever and I gain 19 times two. Yeah. So I'm a little bit older, a little more wrinkly and a little bit chubbier since the last time you saw me. But it's good to be with everybody. It has been uh, six, 26 years now since I was diagnosed with colon cancer. At the time, my kids were three and five years old, and I'd been married about six years. And uh, now I'm a grandmother. I'm a mom of a 31-year-old and a 29-year-old, a mother-in-law to two, and a grandmother to two so far. So um, married to the same guy for 33 years, and you might some of you might remember him. His name is Baggett. Now, some people find that difficult to say. He's originally from Egypt, and... Um, and he, he always says, you can just call me Baggy. One of my friends calls him Ziploc. Anyway, Baggy was standing in line in the immigration office getting ready to come to the University of Minnesota. That's where we're from. And he was standing in line way back in 1983 coming to get his PhD. And the immigration officer said to him, you know, Baguette, it's very cold in, in Minnesota. And he goes, yes, I know this. And he goes, but it gets below zero. Now, my husband thought maybe he was trying to trick him because there's no number. So he said, there's no such number under zero. He goes, you'll find out. And his friend next to him said, oh, no, I do not want to go to someplace cold. Please put me any place that you can that's south, any place south. And the immigration officer said, we can help you out. He wrote down South Dakota on his application. So um, I had goals for myself. When I, I, oh, also I forgot, I have a Chinese brother-in-law too. I mean, our family is expanding and we have a little diversity in our own family. I've got a, a niece from Guatemala. I've got a Chinese brother-in-law from China. His name is Xi, spelled X-I. My father calls him 11. And I love the diversity of it. I love the diversity of our, our United States right now. But there's one thing that's not too diverse yet. It's cancer. And we have got to find a cure for it. And I appreciate all that the Colorectal Cancer Alliance is doing for that. I had goals for myself uh, once I was diagnosed with cancer, and maybe some of you do too. Um, I, had, I still had not ever gone to college, and I had never become a comedian. And so those are the two things I set off to do. Uh, I, I started with comedy, and, it, and I learned it, it takes a lot more work to do comedy than I thought. You have to write your own jokes. You can't do jokes that other people gave you. And you can't tell the jokes, the corny jokes that your dad used to tell. You have to make up your own jokes. And so I started writing jokes, and there was something about it that was so much harder. And I, I couldn't imagine being as good as Ellen DeGeneres or Whoopi Goldberg or Carol Burnett, some of my favorite female comedians. But I really wanted to do it. And, um, but I was busy. I had a hair salon. I had those two little kids at home. And one of my friends who I met, the other matronly woman who was in her 40s, met her at the comedy class. She said, you should really try out for the Twin Cities Funniest Person because they're, they're, um, it's open to anyone who's never been paid to do comedy, essentially amateurs. There was 150 people, young punks, thin young people in their early 20s that looked up. And then there was me. And I won the whole thing. Nobody could imagine it, especially my husband and I. And I won a thousand dollars with my con with that contest too. I told my husband I'd split it with him, so I gave him fifty bucks. Yeah. So, but he really had some ideas for that money too. So he said, "Oh, we've got to go get a satellite dish." I mean, at the time, satellite dishes were so popular, five hundred dollars and included a year of service. So we got to go get the satellite dish, and so. We get the satellite dish and, you know, my husband's so excited and he goes, oh, it's such a, you know, a great satellite dish, but the reception isn't working very well. So I figured out we have to take a tree down, $250. It was the neighbor's tree. They're starting to get over it. They're very polite. So we take the tree down, we've got excellent reception. And then my husband says, oh my gosh, this excellent reception for such a small TV. Don't you think we should get a bigger TV? 
So off we go to Best Buy Company. We get one of those huge TVs. At the time, 52 inches was the biggest TV you could get. And it was so exciting. And while he was there, he found out that they had the Egyptian channel that comes all the way from Cairo, Egypt, with belly dancing 24-7. So we got to have the Egyptian channel. And so the Egyptian channel is playing on the TV. And he goes, you know what? This is so fantastic. And the friends start coming over, his Egyptian friends. They're watching the shows with him. They're having a great time. But he's a little embarrassed about the furniture. So he says, Brenda, we got to get some new furniture. So we go to the store. We got the kind with the recliners. you know. So we've got like eight Egyptians laying around watching the satellite dish. And they don't like chips and cheese and popcorn. No, we got to have hummus and falafel and baba ganache. And now I'm cooking all day long in the kitchen. And my husband's getting homesick for his homeland. He said, we got to go back to Cairo, Egypt. And so we got to get four round trip tickets to go back to Cairo, Egypt. And you can't go empty handed. You have to bring gifts for all the family and friends. Do you know the darn contest ended up costing me $88,000? Terrible. But it's so fun. And so comedy really was the beginning of many things for me. I just, it seems like, but it seems like only yesterday. I mean, my kids were three and five at the time when I started this. And now they're, the, you know, my grandchildren are their age. I remember taking my little son, John, out of his car seat for the first time and putting him in his seatbelt. And, oh, you know how that is. If you have little children, they look so little. And I remember saying to him, John, do you feel lonely back there? He said, no, Mom, I've got God on one side and Jesus on the other. I thought it was so sweet. And he used to tell me all the time, I love you, Mom. I love you. You're the prettiest mom in the world. You're the sweetest mom. You're the funniest mom. Who doesn't love that, you know? And then something happened. He became a teenager. He quit talking, essentially. I mean, he barely opened his mouth. And he invented a new language I'll call grunt. You know, and so I'd say, John, you coming home after school? <clears throat> And I understood what he was saying. Oh, do you want to have pizza with Brian? Oh, yeah. Oh, pepperoni. Okay, yeah, we'll get you some pizza. That'll be fine. And I still longed for those three little words I would say to him. I love you. I love you. And one day he said three little words back to me. Good to know. Mm -hmm. So he goes off to college. He goes to the University of North Dakota because it's not cold enough in Minnesota. And I think to myself, well, he'll write to me, he'll call me, he'll email me. No. Nope. What do the kids do? This texting, texting, texting. So he texts in three word sentences. Home on Friday, do my laundry, I need money. I learned how to text back three little words. Good to know. So, and then my daughter, she grew up so fast too. And I remember when she was about 11, we got her, she was all concerned about getting her first training bra. And she comes home from school and she goes, Mom, I did a right in school with my new bra. And I said, really? How was it? She goes, well, it was okay until I went to gym class. And I said, what happened, honey? She goes, well, I went up to get the volleyball. And when I brought my arms down there, my bra was still up there. Oh, that was not my experience with having a bra. I tell you that. In, in grade school for me, this was the time of women were burning their bras and wondering if they should even wear bras. And who did we turn to? We turned to the most, most well-known columnist there was, Dear Abby, and she gave us the advice. She said, if you can wear, if you can put a pencil under there and it stayed, you should probably wear a bra. For people, I could put a two by four. The sad news is these days I could put a piece of plywood. I have to roll up these babies. Oh, my gosh. But my daughter was so funny. Um, and then <laughs> just blink. You blink your eyes. And then just a couple minutes later, you're blinking. And she's, what, 14 years old now? And we're doing, we're doing stuff. We're taking stuff out of the dryer. And I realize, oh, my gosh, something has fallen to the ground. I do not know what this is. And I pull it. I pick it up. I go, Anna, what's this? She goes, Mom, that's my thong. A thong? Why do you need to wear a thong? She goes, Mom, everyone's wearing one. You should try one. And I go, What for? A bracelet? And she goes, No, Mom, they're really good. Now, at the time, there was this commercial from Victoria's Secrets. And she said, Mom, after all, there's no VPL. And I go, VPL? What's that? She goes, No visible panty lines. I go, Really? I don't have to worry about that. And she goes, Why? And I said, because I have VBR. And she said, what's that? I said, visible belly roll. 
put on one of those thongs. I'll never see that thing for months. So my kids were three and five on October 2nd, 1995. You never seem to forget the date when you were diagnosed with cancer. My husband went to the clinic that day. He had a mole he wanted to remove from his forehead. He didn't like the way it looked. And then we took John because we thought John might have strep throat. And then we have to bring Hannah along because we can't leave her home. She's only three. So we were spending the day at the clinic. Some families go to the zoo, but that's what we were doing that day. And I was so, um, I was there because I'd been having this pain in my butt that I just couldn't get rid of. And I just thought, I put the hemorrhoid stuff up there. I put the tux and the preparation H. I tried all different sorts of things and I realized I cannot get rid of this pain. So I made an appointment and now we're at the clinic and I got to have my butt looked at. And this is, I don't know about you, but it's not my favorite thing. I, I have a big butt. Like I, I have a butt. I mean, it's smaller than it was, but at the time it was really outstanding. Like if I was standing in the kitchen, it was outstanding in the living room. That was a big butt. And now I have to have it looked at. And the doctor's taking a look. He goes, oh, yeah, you got him right. And the next thing he says is, oh, there's another surgeon here. And I want him to take a look. As long as you're here, he can, he can evaluate it as well. And I go, really? In my mind, I turn into sarcasm. Okay, everybody, let's form a line. I'll charge a quarter. Everybody come through. I felt like a circus act, the biggest butt lady. I was so worried about it. Now I'm having my butt looked at by this guy, too. And he comes in, and he does a, a quick vaginal and rectal exam, a digital exam. Like, not digital, digital. Yeah, the old-fashioned digits. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so embarrassing. But I used the, like I said, I just kept using sarcasm to cope with it because it was so uncomfortable. He'd done the quick vaginal and rectal exam, and then he left the room and prepared me for a biopsy. The nurse comes in with the enema kit, and I'm reading the directions, and I'm worried about the next thing. Like, like well, how do you actually do this test? I really knew nothing about it. In my family, when they talked about, um, get, did you get your... Um, procto yet. It was always a very short, quiet little tones. And so here I am in the procto room now. They've dedicated a whole room to it and this doctor's left me alone and I'm worried about him taking a look at my butt like this and how are they going to do this? And I'm telling the nurse, how, how do they examine you? Like, I can't kneel. I've had both of my knees operated on. And she goes, oh, there's no problem with that. The table tilts. Oh, fantastic. So I stand there on the table. Woo! And now my head is lower. And, and it's facing like the carpeting. I'm holding on to that table. And my butt is up in the air. Now, nobody likes to have their butt looked at. Well, that's not true. There was one woman I asked in every audience I've talked to. Who likes to have their butt looked at? Nobody ever raises their hand except for one woman. I guess she likes to have her butt looked at. But that's pretty rare. It doesn't matter if you've got a small butt or a big butt. Most people don't like to look at it. So now I've got the tables tilted and I'm worried about the next thing. Is this going to traumatize the poor doctor when he walks in the door? I mean, is he going to fall over? I mean, is this the biggest butt he's ever seen? And I start thinking, well, he did have white hair. And if he sees five butts a week, that's 20 bucks a, 20 butts a month minimum. And that's like maybe 5,000 butts in 10 years. Well, this could I have the biggest butt? I don't know. So he comes in and he doesn't fall over. It's a good start. He starts putting a rigid proctoscope in there. Remember, this is 26 years ago. Flex sigmoidoscopies were just starting to come into the scene. And this wasn't what neither one of us had planned on. And now I've moved on to the next thing to worry about. I don't know about you guys, but I was thinking, man, should you talk at a time like this? And I decided, yes, I think I will talk. And so the first thing I said to him was, why do you think that God put our rectums way back there? Why not someplace easy to get to? And the guy didn't say a thing. So I thought to myself, well, maybe he didn't hear me. So I spoke up a little bit louder. Kind of a gross job he got there, huh? And he said, well, it might be gross, but it saves lives. He was very serious. Very serious. And so I just realized, okay, there's, there's something going on here. I walked out of the clinic. Now, after my husband and kids came all back, my husband got his mole removed. 
John had strep throat. He sat with the doctor and he said that we're going to have to go schedule a CAT scan. So we scheduled a CAT scan. And um, like many of you, it was a shock for me. In fact, we were just getting comfortable talking about breast and breast cancer. I have a mother who's a breast cancer survivor and a sister who's a breast cancer survivor, but neither of them had breast cancer before I had colon cancer. In all my 20 years as a hairstylist up to this point, no one had ever talked about colorectal cancer with me. Actually, no one really talked about bowel diseases, Crohn's disease or, or colitis disease. I knew very little about the colon. I just had a pain in my butt, and that's why I went in. You know, people talking about their poop shoots just was not polite conversation. But, you know, I decided to talk about it. When I learned that a simple colonoscopy could save someone from having colon cancer, I wanted to tell all my clients. I just needed to tell them. Since then, um, when my when I got back to work, some of my clients would say, how come, how come you were off for three months? I mean, I knew you were going through cancer, but what was going on? I said, well, <clears throat> to save my life, I had to have my um, rectum removed. I had a golf ball-sized tumor in the rectum, and it had to be removed, and so I had to have my cheeks sewed shut. It's kind of like what I have in common with the Barbie doll. I try to make light of it, try to find some way to talk about it in an easier way. I said I also had that part of my vagina removed or reconstructed, and uh, I had a hysterectomy, so I went through menopause. And they were like, wow, you know. They learned a lot. So when I went to my CAT scan, I was terrified what the surgeon had told me earlier. He said, Brenda, if the cancer spread to your liver or your lungs, we won't bother to do this operation. I was like, what? Now, these days, it's not the same. They sucked out the liver. They sucked out the lungs. And things are more hopeful than ever before that your cancer can be treated. Hopefully. And... Um, this is an important test. And I remember going to the CAT scan. I was scared of the, of the CAT scan results. My mother was with me. I was drinking and driving the, the prep solution you drink before you start the CAT scan. And, and we had a very difficult conversation that most mothers and children have when they have cancer. Just, I want to make my life great until I do die, if I have to die from this. I want to do things. I want to live my life the best that I can. It was difficult. And it was hard. And I got to that test and a beautiful young nurse hooked me up with the IV. And you're in that machine and you all know, breathe in, breathe out, hold your breath. And it examines your body, takes the pictures. And at the end of it, this older nurse came to unhook me. And I said, oh, you're not the same person. And she goes, no. As a matter of fact, last week there was a guy in here. The young nurse hooked him up and I came and unhooked him. And he said to me, well, I knew I was in there a long time, but this is ridiculous. So I started realizing that nurse just made me laugh. It was the first laugh I'd had in a few days. And I thought to myself, I've got to really search for more of it. I've got to look for it. I've got to find that laughter. And when I went to the hospital and the surgery was seven hours long, um, it was a difficult surgery. I had just had... 10 different vaginal and rectal exams by 10 different doctors, and they decided on the surgery three weeks later. So it, it was a difficult surgery, but I was lucky. I didn't have to have chemotherapy or radiation. I don't know if they would still feel the same way about that these days, but at the time I did not. I kept looking for the humor. I was in the hospital after I woke up from in, in intensive care, my husband, Baggy, he, he leans down so close to me. I've got the wires and the pneumo boots and everything right around me. And, you're, you know, the noise and the wires. And remember, you know what I'm talking about. And he leans down close to me. And I know he's going to say just the right thing because he loves me. He goes, Brenda, honey, right now you look like the back of my stereo system. It was so stupid it really made me laugh. And I woke up just laughing. And I realized I got to keep noticing the laughter. The laughter is going to help me. Leaving the intensive care after a few days, uh, the orderly put me on a rolling chair and took me to the nurse's station. The nurse was behind me, rolling me along to my room. And, and she patted me on the shoulder from behind. 
And she said, are your privates clean? I go, uh, I mean, I knew I had just had been surgically rearranged. I, I didn't know. And so I started going, uh, uh. she goes, oh, oh, no, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the nurse on the other end of the line. I picked up the phone and I just called down to see if the private rooms are clean. So uh, there again, I have to say it was pretty fun. Strange things happened to me. I mean, the doctor came in and examined me, and he was thrilled about things. And then the other doctor, the gynecological doctor, came in, and he looked at his work. and He was feeling around, and he seemed pretty happy. And um, then he had his whole finger. He said, Brenda, I had my whole finger there. This is great. You're going to make a full recovery. And it's like, it's an awkward moment. You still, like, what do you say? I just said, thanks. You know, and then he left. And um, my favorite nurse came in. She was sarcastic. I really liked her. Her name was Christy. She came in. I said, Christy, the doctor just had his whole finger inside my new for JJ. And she said, oh, oh, my goodness. Well, I hope at least he kissed you first. So it's the nurses and the people around me that helped me get through it with the humor. I loved it so much. Um, later, much to my surprise, I would join the Association of Applied and Therapeutic Humor. I would go through a three-year program talking about the science and research behind humor. There's so much uh, to learn, and there's still, still so many activities happening that are showing different kinds of research. There's a doctor on the West Coast that measures people's brain activity. There's a doctor on the East Coast that measures their um, their blood, their dilation of their blood, depending on what they're watching on TV. If it's a horrible movie, their blood constricts, and otherwise it opens up if they're laughing. So they started doing different kinds of research. I mean, I'm minimizing it. It's, it's so much more. But I love it. And I think there's only, I went through a three-year program. There's just a little bit of over 100 people that have gone through this three-year program, and now I'm accredited as a certified humor professional. So I try to use therapeutic humor, where we don't hurt one another, we help one another. Well, my family might be in that questionable area. But there's four things I learned through the Association of Applied and Therapeutic Humor based on some of the um, research that, that help us each day. And you don't have to do all four, but try to do one every day. First one that comes to mind is meditation and prayer. But some people just can't relax enough to meditate, and some people don't want to pray. But I like to use adult coloring books, and I use a coloring book, and I color, and I use my pencils, and sometimes I'll think of somebody I haven't thought about for a while, and I'll write their name down on that page, and I'll call them later just to see how they're doing. That's a form of meditation, too. Music is powerful. Music is powerful. It relaxes your body. They say that it's better for you to use music in the morning on your way to work than to listen to talk radio. I can believe that. And it's also good to use music when you leave work so that you can kind of re, re-energize for home life. The third thing, well, laughter. I mean, you've got to find a funny friend. You have to have a funny friend. You have to find someone who makes you laugh. You can read jokes. You can watch sitcoms. I like Ellen DeGeneres clips, but I really hate to admit this. My guilty pleasure is watching people, uh, videos of people at weddings when they fall down. I don't know why. It just cracks me up. It doesn't say much for me. But the fourth thing, everyone likes this one, eat a piece of dark chocolate. It's amazing what all these things can do for the body. You know, the dark chocolate does the same thing for the endorphins as so many other things. When when we do any one of those four things, it's tight, it's, the body doesn't recognize the difference between real laughter and fake laughter even. If you want to do a laughter yoga class, the body goes into a fake laughter, but it reacts the same. It can stabilize your blood pressure. It can kick your immune system into high gear. It massages your inner organs. And it increases oxygen supply to your muscles and into your brain. Those are just a few of the things that happen just doing any one of those four things. I'd encourage you to do it. I was lucky that my cancer was all contained in a golf ball-sized tumor. 
and not spread outside my bowel walls. Um, not everyone has the same diagnosis, I realize. We all do the best that we can. Re recently, I met my new dentist, Dr. Bernstein. And you know how they go over your medical records? And he went over mine and he said, Brenda, you're a colon cancer survivor. I said, yes, I am. He goes, I am too. I said, you are? That's cool. And he goes, I I'm actually going through it right now. And I said, really? Yeah, he goes, I was, I was um, diagnosed stage four, four years ago. And I go, really? He goes, yeah, they gave me 18 months to live, but I'm determined to keep living. I said, oh, my gosh, that's fantastic. Well, I said, you did just diagnose me with needing a crown and two cavities. So I hope that you can stay around long enough to finish the work. And then we laughed. But then I said, what's your motivation? What keeps you going? He goes, well, I just had my 103rd chemotherapy treatment. And I have two sons at home, and I want to provide for them. I want to stay around for them as long as I can. And I really, I really understood that. I mean, I had my two little children, too, three and five years old when I was diagnosed, and I wanted to see them grow up. I thought if I did die, my husband would marry some beautiful Egyptian woman, and he'd have a very happy, wonderful, easy life. So, no, he doesn't get to. He stuck with me. And we both laughed, and um, he said something I thought was pretty profound. I said, he said, are you, what stage were you? And I said, I was stage one. Oh, you're lucky. Oh, yep, I was lucky. Very lucky. Um, I did have to have a permanent class made. My private parts rearranged and go through menopause early in life. But you're right. You win. And he goes, no, no, we both win. I really like that guy. He's a very positive influence. And I almost want to have some more teeth problems to go back to him. Such a great guy. People often think that having an ostomy, like a colostomy, is the worst thing. It's not. I just can't find shoes to match my bag. Well, I guess you can. They just look like crap. <laughs> I, was, I was really worried when Delta Airlines came out with that one bag limit, I tell you. And at the time I went through um, menopause, they were using a medication called Primrin. I don't know if they still do, but pregnant mare urine. No wonder I felt like eating oatmeal and sugar cubes for breakfast. I noticed I, I didn't whine anymore, but it kind of whinnied. Like, where are you going, honey? And if my husband suggests a roll in the hay, I just didn't mind. Yeah. That's so funny. My ostomy has not stopped me. It's not stopped me from climbing the Great Wall of China. It's not stopped me from exploring the pyramids of Egypt, swimming in the ocean with stingrays. My ostomy has not stopped me from a 150-mile bike ride in two days. I'm grateful. I'm, a lot of things that people say are like, I'm grateful I had cancer. I can't say that I'm grateful I had cancer, but I'm very grateful for the experience that going through cancer brought me. It made me see the kind of person I am. It made me find out how, how much I need to tell people I love them. I'll leave you with one last story from my, about my friend, Teresa. Several years ago at age 44, she was doing the dishes when a gush of blood came down her leg. That was her first introduction to stage four colon cancer. She had three small children. She planned date, play dates with her kids. She took vacations with the family. She sucked the life that she could out of it while she had it. She had her favorite hobby, scrapbooking. She called me one day. I never met her, but she called me. She goes, I, I just read your book, and it's so good. I, I read your first book, and we have so much in common. And I accept that you were not diagnosed stage four, and I am. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I was wondering if you'd be willing to come to our, our survivor group, and give a talk at our cancer survivor group at the local church. So we're in the same city. And I go, really? I said, how could I turn that down? Of course, I went. I went to that talk, and a man came up to me and said, so I hear that you're funny, and you do some funny things about cancer. I don't think anything can be funny about cancer. I lost my daughter to colon cancer last year. I said, I'm so sorry. Well, let's just see how it goes. So she had talked to me up quite a bit, and so I did my comedy, and at the end of it, she came back up to me and said, I wish my wife had come with me. She would have really enjoyed this. 
So Teresa and I went out afterwards to have a margarita. She liked margarita and chips. And we went out afterwards and got to know her a little bit. She was so sweet. Months later, I ran into her at a church bazaar. We caught up with another margarita after that. And I'd think about her from time to time. And then one day she called me. I hadn't seen her for a long time. She called me up and she was, Brenda, I have a favor to ask of you. I said, what's that? And she goes, I'd like you to do my, uh, I'd like you to do my eulogy. My doctor has told me I have brain cancer now. And I, it's just a month, month, a couple months left. I go, what? You must have it. It must have affected you because you don't ask someone to do your eulogy that doesn't know you that well. Teresa, I've only met you a couple of times. That's something your family should do. What's your husband mind? She goes, oh, no, I already told my husband I'm going to call you and ask you and hope that you'll do it. And I told my kids and everybody's on board. I go, well, they don't even know me. She goes, well, that's the point, Brenda. You're going to have to come and get to know me really quick. So I said, well, okay. I'm going to come over every week and get to know you. So that began my time really getting to know Teresa. And I got to know her husband, her kids, her mom, her sister. And she said, the reason why I picked you for my eulogy is because I want to tell you that you have to give everybody a goodbye message for me, which is to go get a colonoscopy. It could save their life. I want you to tell everyone that. And I want you to be funny, too. I watched her in those last few weeks. She had a celebration of life party where everybody came to the church and she hugged up a couple hundred people. Watched all that tenderness and sweetness. I'd go visit her. Then I had to be traveling for a week. And it was a week before I saw her and I came to see her and she'd been sleeping for two days. She was getting near the end. And she sat up. She woke up. She sat up and she said, have I done enough, Brenda? Have I done enough? I said, yes, Teresa, you've done enough. You've scrapbooked everything that walked by. You went on vacations with people. You told everyone you loved them. Your kids know you love them. Everybody loves you, Teresa. You've done enough. Two days later, she died, and I went to do the eulogy. It was the most important talk I ever gave in my life. No one I knew was there, and I only knew five people there, six people. And I gave the eulogy the best I could, and at the end, and people laughed. And people got the message. And afterwards, people told me, I felt like Teresa was talking to me. And then I knew I had done a good job. So remember, it's okay to laugh in serious situations. We've got to choose how we spend each hour, whether we have days, months, or years. Your illness doesn't define who you are. You're still this beautiful, big life and this big person despite it. We have hope. We always have hope. And when the hope is waning, we have the strength of the people around us to carry us through. I want to thank you so much for listening to me today. And thank you so much for attending the conference. I hope it's everything you hope for. Thank you again, um, the Alliance, for having me speak. It's been my honor and my pleasure to be with you. Bye-bye, everybody.